Good morning. We have a lot of work to do today, so I would invite you to open your Bibles uh, to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Once you uh, have your Bibles open, whether you're on a digital device or um, a real Bible, no. uh, turn to the next person next to you and just say, I'm there. series title that we've been talking about the last four weeks is How to Handle Life Transitions Gracefully. Uh, and this morning I, I want us to look at one final installment of this series. Um, and I, I want to talk today about, about being grateful. I believe grateful to be kind of the secret sauce uh, to dealing with life transitions in a graceful kind of way. And we've been learning, right, that we're never more teachable than when we're going through transition. We're never more moldable than when uh, things come into our life that we didn't expect, that we didn't want, or maybe we invited, and then we decided we didn't want them, and we're in the midst of a difficult transition. And the fact of the matter is, is that every one of you in the room is either going through a transition, has gone through a transition, or are going to go through a transition. Come on, somebody shout something. Yeah, and, and this is a scary thing because... We started this series by surveying everybody. How many of you love change? And like three hands went up. So this is a problem, isn't it? Because to the degree that you embrace change, to that degree, you will grow. Because your growth is a function of how you handle life transitions and change. So we've been talking about change and transition this whole month, and we started by talking about it in our personal lives, and then we talked a little bit about how uh, family can be involved in a lot of change and transition, and then last week we just tackled the elephant in the room, the leadership transition that's going on right now, right here, today in the room, the leadership transition of your lead pastor. <laughs> Somebody say, uh-oh. And we discovered, though, last week that God uses change to expand his kingdom. Amen? Amen? That when change comes into, introduced into the Bible, from the Old Testament all the way through uh, to the New Testament, that God introduces leadership changes because he wants to expand his kingdom and expand his fame. And so even this leadership transition, as much as today is an uncomfortable day for me because of I had to do all the announcements. Uh, God, God is moving me and my family because God has something for us to expand his kingdom. And God has something here, something new, something fresh, something different for the purposes of expanding his kingdom. Ooh, you got to say, give me a good amen for that one or I can't preach my sermon for today. Like, you have to believe that. And one of, the, one of the strategies that Satan will have in your life in the coming weeks is that you're going to be tempted to not handle transitions gracefully. And today, I want to I come at you. Ooh, I'm working hard today. This is not a phone it in sermon today. <laughs> today is about gratefulness because I believe that gratefulness is the key is the key to you handling transitions gracefully. Here's what I know about grateful people. Grateful people are graceful people. And graceful people are grateful people. Come on now, I'm preaching. And, and, and some of you get grumpy and bitter and, and angry. And when you're going through transitions, life transitions that you don't want or that you didn't invite or that you don't understand, and we talked about that, haven't we? We've talked a little bit about we don't understand why God does everything that God does. But the better, more important question is, God, what do you want to teach me? How do you want me to handle this transition? How do you want to change me and transform me so that I become a better, clear reflection of your grace and your mercy in my life and your kingdom is expanded? So for a few minutes today, I want us to look at this text in Philippians. I've titled my sermon today, I'm Thankful. Say these two words with me. Yeah. Can you honestly actually say that about your situation right now that you're going through? Can you honestly say, 
about the transition that you're going through or that you have gone through or that you're about to go through, the difficult ones especially, can you honestly say, I'm not, I'm not like talking about the Sunday face that you put on when you get out of your car and come on Sunday morning. I'm talking like, can you genuinely say that you're grateful? Because to the extent that you can, you will handle the transition gracefully. Philippians chapter 1 is this incredible letter that Paul writes to uh, the church in Philippi. Uh, he's writing, by the way, from prison. So he's not in a great spot, is he? How many of you would love to end your life in prison? <laughs> I never really thought to ask that, but uh, he's not in a good place. He's in, he's in prison. And, and yet I want you to see how he's looking at his current situation and circumstance and when he looks back at his time in Philippi, he's full of joy. He's full of gratitude. Paul, verse 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Bible's open. Uh, Tim, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Say joy. joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want to just stop here for a minute and just remind us a little bit of historical uh, data on Philippi. Philippi was the first... Christian church in Europe. It was planted by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey around A.D. 50 or 51. The city of Philippi was located about 10 miles inland from the coast, directly northwest of the nearest port city. And there was a strategic area in ancient times. It was kind of like this fertile plain, uh, and they called it the Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Way. It was a, tri a trade highway that linked the Aegean and Adriatic Seas. So many travelers passed through Philippi. When I read a little bit of background on this, it reminded me of the 210 corridor. Come on now. <laughs> That's our version of the Ignatian Way. It, we, we, are, we are in the middle of this. We, we connect to different places. So Paul could have, put have, could have just been writing to uh, the, the church at Grace Church of Glendora. There was no synagogue. Acts chapter 16 is the story of how Philippi was started. Um, and, and when he got to Philippi, there was no synagogue. And so he went to the riverbank because he knew the Jews would be gathered at the riverbank. And he starts to preach the gospel and he meets a lady named Lydia, uh, a, a businesswoman. And she comes to faith in Christ. Somebody shout amen. amen. And the text in Acts chapter 16 says that her household came to faith in Christ as well. Come on now. Uh, you know, this is my last sermon. i got to talk about Oikos. Those people that were supernaturally and strategically placed in her life after she received the gospel, she shared it with her 8 to 15, and they came to faith in Christ. Somebody shout, that's the way it's done. The way it's done. And so the church was started. Paul and Silas um, get a little spirit-filled, and they cast out a demon from a slave girl. Acts chapter 16. And this gets them in trouble. In fact, it lands Paul and Silas, my grandbaby Silas is on the campus today now, come on, uh, in prison. In prison. Now, I was excited when I, when I, I didn't plan it this way, but after we determined that this was going to be the last Sunday, I realized that today is Pentecost Sunday. Woo, that's a good way to go out. You all know what Pentecost Sunday is, right? Uh, you're nodding your head, but you're not being very confident with that. <laughs> Pentecost Sunday is the Sunday we celebrate that the, the, the Holy Spirit came down and um, inhabited uh, people, and they spoke in tongues, and, and people came to faith in Jesus Christ, and, the, and it's really the birth, the birth day of the church, yeah. And, and so on this day, uh, Paul and Silas are in prison, and the Holy Spirit comes, and chains are broken, and in that, in Acts chapter 16... 
uh, not to make my oikos point again, but in Acts chapter 16, the jailer comes to faith in Christ and his oikos, his household, his oikodomeo, the people that God has supernaturally and strategically placed around him. Okay, so that's, that's Philippi. That's how Philippi was started. Paul now is writing and reflecting back on the ministry at Philippi, and he says in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you, verse 4, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Why? Why is he joyful? Why is he grateful when he thinks about the church at Philippi? Because, verse 5, of your partnership. Say partnership. This is the Greek word koinonia. This is a common word if you've been in church at all. If you're brand new to churches, this is your first day at Grace. This is a great day to be your first day. You can say you came on John's last day. Um, It's the word koinonia. Say koinonia. Yeah. So this word is, it describes, uh, in your English version, you might say, it might say fellowship. It might say participation. It's a word that is used to describe not just the casual coffee and donut type of fellowship that we might have on a Sunday morning. This word is a special word in Scripture. This word is, is describing the absolute divine partnership and relationship that we have together around the purpose and mission and body of Christ. It means being caught up into the belonging or partnership which God has created and sustained. In other places in Scripture, it's used to describe the actual spiritual relationship of communion that we have with Christ. It is participating in something divine and eternal, something greater than we could ever be or do on our own. That's what koinonia is. It's not simply uh, meeting somebody at common grounds at our cafe and grabbing a scone and a coffee and talking about the weather. No, no, no. It it's always involves food, but it goes much deeper than that. And Paul, when he looks back on his time with Philippi and he remembers them, their, the way that they started the church, the, the inclusion of women in the church, the gospel and how it spread from Jews to Gentiles in that particular area. He says, I'm joyful, I'm grateful, because you were a participant in it. You didn't just stand on the side, but you got in and you served. It means that when he remembers them and he reflects on their partnership with him, he remembers that they serve together for the gospel. This is the second very important thing that I want to leave with you today about being grateful, about being graceful, is gratefulness in the context of a church community is anchored in the gospel. You will have a difficult time staying unified. You will have a difficult time staying positive. You will have a difficult time if you don't understand that what unifies you is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not some goofball like John. It is not any individual person. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Build your church on the gospel and you will be grateful. Build your church on a personality and you will get grumpy. You know why you won't get grumpy? Because as good as this dude is, and I've been here a long time, I've ticked off enough of you on any given Sunday. (laughs) Gratefulness comes, is anchored in, is sourced in the gospel. That's the secret to being grateful. The secret to being grateful is not to be some tigger and just not worry about the pain and the, and the anxiety and the unknowns. And so I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to drink it all away. And know oh, everything's fun, you know. No, that's not, that's not being grateful. That's not being graceful. Being grateful is understanding what's at stake. It's the gospel. Paul will say it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, one of our theme verses uh, here at Grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you don't need to turn there, but... Paul saying, I'm free to belong to no man. I make myself a slave to everyone that I may win as, possi- win as many as possible, right? To the Jews, I become like a Jew. To the free, as that, that one is free. To the weak, I become weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all men 
so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do all this, Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. Gratefulness. Gracefulness comes and is maintained and it, and it grows as it is anchored in the gospel. Paul says that I may share in, his, in its blessings. As Paul reflects back on the church at Philippi, he realized that they served together for the gospel. They prayed together for the gospel. They suffered together for the gospel. They cried together for the gospel. They worshiped together for the gospel. They supported one another in practical and concrete ways. By the way, by the way when Paul uses this word, he's not using it as a sort of a, 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 a high theological concept. <laughs> He's using it to describe the very concrete ways in which this church partnered with him. They supported one another in practical and concrete ways with meals and money and connections and medicine and hospitality. They saw God do miracles together for the purpose of expanding the gospel. They had a vision for their city together. This city of Philippi historically will become a massive center of Christian thought over the centuries. They had vision for their city together. They loved each other like family in the good times and in the difficult times. And Paul is chained, but he's not focusing on his own change and chains. He's in fact focusing on the fact that as he looks back on his ministry with Philippi, he is joyful, he is grateful because of the partnership that they had. This is so good. And this is the gift that you have given to me. The gift of your partnership. It's not just a warm and fuzzy feeling. It's concrete. In fact, look at verse 7 of Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Paul says, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have had you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. You, all of you, share. There's the same word again, share. It's, the, it's a different um, version of the word koinonia. You have shared and you have participated in, you have, you have been um, in with me, in God's grace with me, and verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul was very concrete when he thought about the joy and the gratefulness of this church because they had participated with him. He's not just speaking in general pastoral terms. There is a concreteness to his memory. They gave money. They put them up in their, in, in, in their homes. They opened their homes. They showed up. They stood strong. And when he's reflecting back on their partnership with him, it brings him great joy. I don't for a moment to be, came, claim to be anything like the Apostle Paul, and I certainly didn't plant this church. But you have done the same for me and with me, and alongside of me. You have given me the gift of your partnership, your fellowship, your communion. You have shared your life with me around the gospel. And when I think of you, I am grateful. If you're in the house today and you have been a part of our elder board in the past or in the present I want you to stand for just a moment if you have been an elder in the past or in the present we have some former elders in the house today Grace family would you just give honor to these men you may be seated I thank my God when I reflect back on my service here because of your partnership in the gospel with me elders I want to honor you today and charge you to fulfill your assignment now in this transition with joy and gratitude. 
There will be challenges ahead. There are always challenges in transitions like this. And your joy and your gratitude will set the tone for everyone else in this family to follow. If you are grumpy and bitter and small-minded, let me say this with a smile on my face. If you are grumpy and bitter and small-minded, you will make room for the congregation to follow you into those spaces. If you are joyful and grateful for the honor of serving and leading this gospel ministry, even when it gets difficult, people will see in you your gratefulness, people will see in you your gracefulness, and they will follow you in that. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. This is the secret sauce to dealing with life transitions gracefully. Isn't it interesting how almost every one of us in the room can very quickly find something wrong that's in a situation? In fact, as I reflect on the Apostle Paul, not to get all theological on you, but let's, yes, to get theological on you for just a moment, the Apostle Paul is in prison. In fact, mm, this was not in my manuscript. Chap verse 12 of chapter 1. Bible's open. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Oh, really, Paul? You're in prison and now you're saying that it's advancing the gospel? I would think you would be doing a better job if you weren't in chains in prison. Oh, no, no, no. The Apostle Paul says, no, no, no. You know what's so great about being in prison? Oh, this is so good. This is so good. Some of you in the room are in a situation and you feel like you're in prison. You feel like you're in chains. You feel like everything is falling apart around you and you're like, oh, man, if I could just if I could just be there, if I could just have that job, if I could just have this house, if I could just be married to this person. No, you don't say that, would you? If I just had kids like they had kids, then I could expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the Apostle Paul says? Okay, I don't need, I'm going to read it to you so that you know exactly what he said. Uh, as a result, he says, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone that I am in chains for... Christ, you know what? You know how Paul looked at his change? You know how Paul looked at his, his bad situation? He's like, you know what? This is great for the gospel. You know why? Because they're chained to me. They don't have a choice. They got to come feed me. They got to come hang out with me. They got to come be because I'm in chains. I'm a prisoner. And so the gospel now is being spread despite my change. And Paul says, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to whine. I'm not going to think about all the things that have gone injustice for me. I am going to choose to be grateful. Why? Because the gospel is going out. Oh, come on, Grace Church, get excited about that. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're not hurting. It doesn't mean that we sweep stuff under the carpet. It doesn't mean we just walk around with plastered smiles on our face. That's not what it means. What it means is that you're never more teachable than when you're in transition. And God's never done growing you, which means you're going to be in transition the rest of your life. Come on now. <laughs> which means the function of your growth is a function of how you embrace change. And, and the function of whether you're graceful is are you going to be grateful in that. And the key to being grateful is understanding that the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, not your comfort, not what you want, not being able to sit in your chair. Ooh, here I go. It's my last day. What can they do? <laughs> it's the gospel, Paul says. It's the gospel. Elders, if you choose to be grateful, you will be graceful. And the only way to be that is to anchor yourself in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're in the room and you're a staff member uh, or you've been a part of our staff team in the past, there are a couple of you in the room that I've noticed that I'm not going to look at because I'm going to start crying that are in the room. Stan Smith is in the house today. Come on now. Come on. Every staff member stand up. Every staff member stand up. Every staff member stand up. I got... I got Jeff Ellsworth in the house over here, former worship pastor at Grace Church, Jen Wagner. Stay standing for just a minute. All staff members are standing up. Yeah. I thank my God. I thank my, stay standing. I thank my God when I reflect back on my service here because of your partnership in the gospel with me. 
You have come alongside me in the most practical and helpful of ways, koinonia, opening doors before I get on campus. Most of you in the audience do not know the extent to which this team has gone to care for me. If it's not Meg Pettiville, it's Rick Langlow showing up. They've paid attention to when I come on campus. My outside door is almost always unlocked because they don't want me to have to navigate steps in different parts of the campus. The degree of anxiety in the room on any given Sunday is high um, because one never knows what John is going to do. Let's start there. <laughs> one is concerned that if John does something crazy, John might fall. You have shouldered the burden of my unseen and sometimes seen disability. You have carried stuff for me. You are always sitting on the edge of your seat prepared to help me if I fall down or just do something that isn't in the service order. Come on. <laughs> so I thank my God when I reflect back on my service with you. Together we have seen God provide and protect and lead and guide us through each week. And when I think back, I'm grateful for each of you and how you have expressed the goodness of God to me in the most practical and concrete and koinonia kinds of ways. And for that, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Please, family, would you put your hands together? Come on, give me a, give me a, give me a deal. I got something. I got, I got something. Yeah, about, yeah. Woo! Congregation, congregation. And if you're here for the very first day, if this is your first day at Grace Church, I've not met, probably met you. But I mean this from the genuineness of my heart. You might as well just be my family if you just showed up. It has been the greatest joy of my ministry life to learn and grow with you. I don't know really what it's like to pastor another church because I've only ever been here. And I thank my God like the Apostle Paul did, I thank my God when I reflect back on my service with you here. You have partnered with me. You have allowed me space to be crazy. You have, you have encouraged me to be myself in the power of the Holy Spirit. And no pastor can ask for more than that from their congregation. You have loved me so well. You have learned with me. You have given me the gift of followership. You've given me space to learn and grow and fail and succeed and so much more. And I will miss you. I was, thinking about, I was thinking about you as a congregation and trying to just ask God for an image that might um, depict what, what, what you have been for me. And so I, I brought a, a special chair today. Can you grab that for me real quick, uh, Ed Castro? Can you put your hands together for Ed Castro? I haven't talked, I haven't tried to headline my disability here because I, I want to be, I want to headline my life in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, not a disability. Come on, somebody say something. And some of you who know me a little bit closer know that I can be uh, a, a little um, stubborn. Say stubborn. And when it comes to my disability, I can tend to be a little stubborn. Uh, a, a while back, um, it became difficult for me to exercise by, by, uh, by walking even, and, and so I, we ended up, uh, my wife and I ended up at, a, at an expo, and we bought this, it's called Freedom Chair, say Freedom Chair. Freedom. I love the title of this chair, because there's a lot of different ways that I could look at this chair. <laughs> right? Come on, say yes. yes. Yeah. And, and, but every time I sit down in it, every time I sit down in it, um, I'm, I'm, it's okay, my son is in the house today, so he'll pick me up, okay? Uh, I'm, I realized that, that I could look at this chair in a lot of different ways, right? I could look at this chair 
um, as, as a, something that is restrictive to me, doesn't allow me to you know, walk and run and, and, and do things that I, I, I love to do. Um, I could, I guess, make a choice to, to look at this in a, a negative way and say, well, it still doesn't really help me go up uh, GMR very well. <laughs> you know, um, uh, who needs a seatbelt, right? <laughs> so when I think about you as a congregation, this chair came to my mind this week as I thought about you. You've been flexible. You've been adaptable. Um, I've preached on stools. I've preached from a wheelchair. I've preached standing. I've preached uh, just about in any way, shape, or form. And what I, what I am so grateful for is that you have not defined my relationship to you based on my disability but you have allowed my disability to challenge and inspire us all to not allow it to determine what all God wants to do in your life. Amen. I've never really preached on the road before, but I wanna, somebody here this morning, somebody here this morning needs to just know that Whatever you're chained to, whatever your disability is, whatever you're struggling with, you know what? You have a choice to make with that. You can allow it. You can be bitter about it. You can, um, I'm not sure how I'm going to get back, but, <laughs> oh, wait, there's food on the plaza. Who needs to go back? So congregation, I want you to stand. I thank my God when I reflect back on my service with you here. You have allowed me and encouraged me to grow in my faith and in my leadership. You have been flexible. You have been adaptable. You have gone to places that were unfamiliar to you and to me. More recently, just our understanding of the power and role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Can we give testimony? that God is at work and the Holy Spirit is at work in this place, in your life and in my life and in our lives together. And the Holy Spirit is not restricted in any way, shape, or form by any of your limitations. In fact, Paul is going to argue that your limitations are, in fact, the most powerful part of your testimony. So I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. I want to commission you. You are full of the Holy Spirit. You are the church. All right, give me, come on, give me one of those. Give me one of those, Ed. You're falling asleep over there. Come on, give me another one. Yeah, here we go. With them. Yeah. Let's do one more just because I love you so much. Yeah. All right, sit down. I need two more. Now there's one more person in the room that I want to give honor to and I do so with great joy and great gratitude and full of grace. Um, pastors' wives oftentimes are told what they have to do in a church and that can be difficult 
when that doesn't match or align with the way that God has created that particular individual. And my wife is in fact the most remarkable woman on the planet. Uh, she has served alongside me using her gifts and her personality and God knew and God knew that I needed her partnership in ministry and God knew that Grace Church needed her partnership in this ministry and so for just about 30 seconds now I'm going to do something that really my wife hates. Um, early on in my ministry here, the elders were very clear that the role of my wife was to love me and to, and to use her gifts to serve the body of Christ the way that God put her together. So just somebody say amen. amen. Now I'm going to let you clap in a second. Just hold on. So, uh, Carly, for just a moment, just a brief moment, allow me, <laughs> allow me to, sh to take the spotlight and just shine it over to you for just a minute. You are remarkable. Your, your quiet leadership um, behind the curtain, um, behind the scenes has allowed me to do what I do. You are wise. You are discerning. You are kind. You are compassionate. You are full of the Holy Spirit. When people see you on our campus, they have no idea of the sheer power in your being through the Holy Spirit. Your ministry to this community and to fostering some 15 little kids and adopting one has been a testimony to your great faith and your great courage far beyond mine. You are a better leader than I am you are a more faithful follower of Jesus Christ. I aspire to be like you in your faith and in your walk. And you have shouldered more than anybody else in this room the anxiety of your crazy husband <laughs> in public doing things that are not scripted. But the, the gift that you have given me to believe in me and to believe that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are inhabiting me in these spaces. This is the greatest of all gifts for a pastor. And I thank my God for you. And for just a brief 30 seconds, I'm going to give the family a chance to just lift this roof off the ceiling in praise to God for my wife, Carolee Dix. Would you do that? Yeah, come on, come on. I got two of these. Woo! We're going to shed them all over. Yeah! Come on, give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up. Yeah! So good. So good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, now that I've gone long, I can blame you all for, for clapping so long. Now I'm going to invite Bill Fiella up here in just a second, and Bill wants to say some words as our elder, and then we're going to just pray together. But I, I can't not go back to this passage in Philippians chapter 1 and remind you that God is not done with you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6b 
uh, says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God is not done with Grace Church. God is just beginning with Grace Church. Amen? Amen. And the greatest gift, the greatest of all gifts, the greatest of all gifts, hear me now, the greatest of all gifts that you can, you can give any pastor, the greatest of gifts that you can give any pastor is, is this gift that Paul mentions in, 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 this, in this verse. A confidence that, that God who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. And I, I, I just want to remind you again, I, I will, this will always be my home church. This will always be the place uh, that, that God um, used in my life and, and allowed me uh, to serve here for so long. This, this, this place will always be home and always be special. And I have every intention of coming back, whether I'm invited or not, uh, to preach a couple sermons and to cheer you on and to encourage you because like the Apostle Paul, I want to say to you, I'm confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on until the day of completion, which is the day of Christ to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Paul finishes this last little section by saying, and this is my prayer for you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern, right? Practice, practice. You may be able to live out, koinonia, what is best and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. God, thank you for your church. Holy Spirit, thank you for this Sunday that we call Pentecost Sunday, a Sunday that we are reminded to invite you again and again, to anticipate, to wait for you to come. And we're praying, God, that you would come again and again. Holy Spirit, come again and again and fill us and guide us and lead us to expand your kingdom through the gospel. We are grateful. We are joyful. We are full of grace because of what you've done for us. Take now the words of my heart and the meditations of my, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart that I have shared today, Holy Spirit, and plant them deep into the souls of every person listening to my voice. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you welcome Bill up to the platform here? Good morning, family. I was before you uh, a couple of weeks ago and said I had drawn the short straw. Um, I feel like I drew the long straw today, <laughs> actually. It's kind of an honor to be here. Um, I'm here in lieu of our elder board chair, uh, Bob Osborne, who is homesick today, um, but really wanted to be here and is very sad that he's not here. So um, John told me he was only going to preach for 20 minutes, so I have another sermon for you. Um, not really. Uh, but I do have the opportunity to share some brief thoughts of appreciation on behalf of the elders. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13 says, We appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. John, Carolee, and family, we love you and thank you for all that you've poured into this family for the past two and a half decades. 24 years, and commend you for a job well done in the Lord on our behalf and for our benefit. The truth is, as much as we've gotten to see John in action over the years, I don't think we can ever really grasp the magnitude of responsibility and all that it means to pastor a local church. Paul does give us a glimpse in the, of this in 2 Timothy 4.2. He says this, he gives his charge to Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Pastor John, you've preached the word. 
How many times have we heard John say to us, let's open our Bibles too, before he said anything else. And I once heard uh, someone describe it this way. Uh, growing up, I can remember my mom making two or three really special meals that were really memorable meals. Mm -hmm. But I know throughout all of my years growing up, I ate well. And I was always full. Thank you, John, for consistently providing us with solid food. And for sharing your joy in uncovering the word for us. Uh, this is so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> And thank you for sharing your authenticity, just as you did again today, yeah. for letting us live your story with you and interweaving that with the story of the church and of God. You have faithfully guided us through the truth of Scripture to greater maturity in Christ. And we are grateful to God for gifting you in this way and blessing the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart. Amen. Are we grateful? Yeah. Yeah. Paul told Timothy... Paul told Timothy to be prepared. John, thank you for being faithful and ready when you were called upon from being an associate to being the lead pastor of this church in a very hard time for this church. Tremendous pain and tumult, and you were ready. You were prepared for the call. Another version of, of this uh, uh, phrase says persistent, be persistent. As lead pastor, you've regularly reminded us to stay on mission equipping this church family to win the lost. And thank you for introducing me, uh, I don't know, many of you probably as well, to the idea of oikos. Mm -hmm. Frankly, the idea of sharing the gospel for me can be a little bit anxious. And uh, the idea of oikos just makes it all that much more doable. Uh, yeah. Thank you for introducing me to that. We're grateful to God that you were open and ready to lead in the season that you were called. Are we grateful? Be prepared in season and out of season. The version I read says, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, right? For two and a half decades, you've shepherded this church through times of victory, like the successful campaign to become debt-free as a church. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you remember baseball bats and golf clubs knocking those one at a time, those boxes off of the stage, right? That's great. But also the challenges of unhealthy leadership and division that preceded you as your role of lead pastor and the navigation of a long season of healing and restoration for this church. You oversaw the creation of bridge services, which didn't quite work out as planned. <laughs> of hey. outdoor services and singing behind plastic shields yeah. during a pandemic that we never could have anticipated to our current 11 o'clock service that has been, frankly, more than we could have imagined. Late nights, early mornings, long meetings, a short greeting before service as you prowl the sanctuary. There's a season for everything. And John, you can rest in the knowledge that God has used you through the hard seasons and the good seasons. And sometimes the hard seasons are the good seasons. We are grateful to God for your leadership and his faithfulness through you. Are we grateful? Yes. Paul charged Timothy to correct. In my version, it says convince. I've heard a number of stories from members of the congregation over the past month of how John saw something in you that maybe you didn't see yourself, and he called that out and gave you the confidence to move forward in that knowing that you could do all things through Christ. John, thank you for convincing us when we didn't see it ourselves. Thank you for believing in me and in us and stretching me and us with your vision for what could be for me as an individual, for us as a body. Rebuke. One of a pastor's most difficult jobs 
is caring enough to confront us uh, individually or corporately when we've missed the mark. And John, you have told us the truth in love. And we're grateful for your rebuke. That's not an easy job, but we appreciate it. Even when it was hard to hear. Encourage. You have encouraged me personally through difficult challenges in my own life. But also, as I've watched you and Carolee in relationship with your family, your love for God, for your children, and seeing you and Carolee's generosity and compassion through your passion through, for foster care. Um, and, and, and maybe, could I just, you've done this already, but I want to take a time out. Claire, Joseph, Luke, Megan, I know it means the world to your folks that you're here. And Audrey in cyberspace, I know it means the world that you're here as well. Thank you, kids, for your love and support for your parents. Yeah, thank you. But not just that, you yourselves have impacted the life of this church as you have been here. I love the picture of uh, 2000, February 2000, right? You're still adorable, by the way. So great. But you've made your own impact. Just as we can't imagine what it would mean to be the spouse of a pastor, to be a pastor's kid, it's, hard, it's a hard life. And I just want uh, to, to live under that microscope. You've done an amazing job. And so, so thank you. Thank you for modeling that for us. And Carol Lee, the only job more challenging than pastor may be that of the pastor's spouse. Um, we want to thank you for your faithfulness to God's calling on your life to partner with John in this ministry, and it is a partnership. Although you didn't seek the spotlight or acknowledgement, we have seen you. We've seen your quiet strength upholding your family. John quotes the people that he receives wise, wise counsel from, but he quotes you the most when he talks about wise counsel. Your kind and gracious spirit and your love for God have been obvious and have been a blessing to me and to all of us. Dick's family, you've done all this with great patience and careful instruction. Thank you for your commitment to submitting Grace Church to the direction of the Holy Spirit and for modeling what it looks like to strive to be spirit-led in your own life. You walk the talk. John, I love you. You're my friend. And I'm grateful to God for you. Are we grateful? So church, I'd like to give you a charge. If we go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says this, and these I hope can be our responses in this next season, to rejoice always. Let's commit to remembering with fondness the blessings of the last 24 years and to sharing the joy of those stories with those who will join us in the years to come. Let's pray without ceasing. I'm going to invite uh, Vikan Tashjian and Cliff Stunden to the front, and they're going to lead us in a word of prayer in a minute. But as the Dix family is entering a new season and Grace Church is entering a new season, let's commit to continuing in prayer for the Dix family, for their transition out east to the other coast, and for all that God has planned for them. And let's commit to prayer for one another through this season of transition at Grace that God would order our steps as well. And then Paul says, giving thanks in all circumstances. Pastor John, thank you for your focus on appreciation in the midst of change. As John has shared with us, the sixth stage of grieving is gratitude. Um, but please understand the stages of grieving are not steps. They're a cycle. And so there are going to be times when we feel a little down. There are going to be times we feel a little angry. But let's commit together to being grateful, regardless of how we're feeling in that moment. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Are we grateful? John, clearly we're grateful. Amen. I invite them, members of the congregation, to come and. Yeah, yeah, let's have them come up, though. Let's invite the. Morning, family. We're going to do a prayer for 
Grace Church as a whole. Those of you that want to come forward and, and participate in prayer, maybe closer to the circle here, free, feel, feel free to come on up. Um, there's plenty of room. You can just stand if you like, sit, whatever your posture is, that's fine. Yeah, come on. Yeah. We got plenty of space. Keep coming. Father, we have so much gratitude. So 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 thankful for Grace Church blessed this church for 70 years and, and there's a reason for that. We pray that as we move forward we can continue to shed the light on our community, those in our homes, uh, just the general surrounding, the way that this church has done that for so many years. Father, I pray specifically for this congregation that uh, you give us patience, joy, calm, all the things that are of you in this process. I pray for our staff, that you give them endurance, and that you give them joy, and the ability to, to function with enthusiasm. Father, for, for leadership, the elder, elder board, I pray that you give us wisdom, discernment, clear vision, and a time as we move forward. I pray that just as we have, just as much gratitude that uh, we show how we can be graceful as well as we move forward. Lord, in transition, we know that when, when there's health like this and that there's strong bond in community, that Satan's going to try and do his work. And so I pray that as, as we move forward and we are in our process of uh, our search, that you help us stay clear, unified. You give us the vision needed. You have our ears perked and be able to discern what is of you. Keep our eyes clear just so we can see you and we know this is of you. Father, I pray that in all that we do here at Grace Church, it is through you, it is of you, and we please into you. Amen. Jesus, over 20 years ago, the leadership of Grace Church of Glendora faithfully prayed that you would provide us with a pastor that would fulfill the needs of our church family and to take us to the next steps in growing spiritually and winning the lost. We thank you for their vision. As a result, we have joyfully experienced and embraced the fulfillment of their prayers in John and Carol Lee through their humility, their leadership, their personal example of what you've called all of us to become. Lord, we are deeply grateful for you leading them to us. Everyone present here this morning is somewhat saddened, but at the same time excited for their future and what you have prepared for them. During this time of transition, all of us humbly come before you and we ask three things of you as the Dix family moves back east. First, as all of us know, moving is stressful. There's 101 decisions to make. And after we think that we've completed them all, we realized that we forgot several. Moving is stressful emotionally and physically. So we ask that you keep them safe as they pack and as they travel to their new home in Maryland. Secondly, that you lead them to just the right church, family, and that you continue to bless their marriage and provide little Nia with friends and teachers that would complement her parents' instruction in the love and the admonition of the Lord. And finally, that you would keep them strong and healthy, especially Pastor John, as they venture into the next chapter of their lives together. We cannot thank you enough, Lord, 
for how you've provided for the Grace Church family and the Dix family. And we are excited for their future and for ours. And all God's people said, <laughs>